Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, some people might be trickling in still, which is absolutely great. Um, and I see some new faces, which welcome to everybody. So you may hear a little bit of repeat from this beginning, but this is our, our dual perspectives uh, session. And it's a combination of, of two different parts. The first part we just heard um, from Mustafa, who is a sibling from Pakistan, impact, who lives in Canada, impacted by HD. Um, and then we had Charlotte, who is from the UK, who is the daughter um, and was sharing her journey. And then we had Josephine from Sweden, who was sharing her journey as a partner impacted by HD. Um, and now we want to share a different perspective of the same family nucleus, uh, because we know that this disease affects people, even though it's, it's, it seems similar from the outside or can seem similar from the outside it affects everybody in its own in its own way. So right now we have, um, and they'll introduce themselves, but the other part of the sibling structure, father and partner. Okay, so I start with yep, introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm Minahil. So I was born in Pakistan, raised there, and I moved to Germany about five to six years ago. I'm based in Berlin now. My relationship to HD is that my mother had HD. I think she started showing symptoms a year after I was born. I had no prior relationship to her besides watching her with the disease. So never really got to know her as a person, just saw her suffering most of my life. She passed away when I was 12. Um, I'm at risk. I haven't been genetically tested, 23. So just dealing with all, all of that comes with it. Hi, everyone. My name's Paul, Paul Conn, um, Charlotte is my daughter who just spoke. Um, basically, my exposure to HD is the fact that um, Elaine's nana had HD, as, as we found out after on post-mortem. Uh, Elaine's mum had HD, Elaine has HD, Charlie has HD, and we have another daughter, Hannah, who's younger than Charles, who's uh, at risk of HD, but hasn't made that decision yet. Uh, we live in Durham in the UK, uh, North UK, and that's it. So I'm Dennis, I'm from Sweden. And uh, before I met Josephine, I never heard about HD. So um, it's a lot of input when you hear something like, like HD. It's uh, very all overwhelming. And uh, yeah. I just want to point out, this is, is it all of your first times to do something like this? Let's give them a round of applause for that. It takes, as we've said, it takes a lot of bravery to be able to do this and, and emotions are real and everybody can, and can understand that. So thank you for, for putting yourself out there for this. Um, can you share a little bit about when you first learned about Huntington's disease and what was the circumstance? Yeah, so like I said, I haven't heard anything about it before I met Josephine. And um, yeah, it's been a long journey, um, emotional journey. Uh, a lot of doubts. Can I support her in this enough? Can I make it in the relationship? Um, so it's like Josephine said, it's been three, about three years she got the test done. Um, we just like for six, like six months ago, I felt ready to step in, in into the HD world, if you say. Uh, before that, I used like, all my energy to support, support Josephine in, in her journey. So now I'm starting to get ready to start my own journey because like Josephine said, uh, I'm gonna be there for her all the way. So uh, it's, for me, it's a big step to be here today um, I'm not much for emotions, never been, so, and I'm not 
much for social social things either. So, <laughs> so I was just thinking, oh, I'm going to throw myself into it. So it, it's going to be done. Um, my experience is uh, professionally, I started my career as a nurse, um, so I had some ex exposure to Huntington's disease, especially when I worked in the nursing homes when I was doing a degree after I'd become a nurse. Um, and basically those, those people at that time were very poorly, they were bed fast. Um, so at that time, it had no personal connection whatsoever, just, I just knew that they were patients I was caring for. Um, fast forward then to obviously the beginning of, of, turn of the, literally the turn of the, the century and obviously then obviously we knew Betty which is Elaine's nana, um, Lynn, Lynn's mum and Elaine basically it all happened pretty much at a, a very short space of time in terms of the fact that her HD was basically part of our world and it still didn't really have the same significance as I did, didn't really make the connection between the people who were I'd looked after in the nursing homes for whatever reason and the people who were now part of my everyday life. Um, there was no connection there whatsoever because they were all, especially Elaine was fit and well and as was Lynn at that time. Uh, so that's my first exposure to it. Um, so my story was a bit um, very different actually. It was very, very brutal I would say. So of course, um, like I mentioned before, I was born, my mom was already sick, so growing up I just saw someone who was sick, didn't know what it was, no one actually knew, my mom didn't know what it was either, so technically I never even actually got to have a proper conversation with her because by the time I was old enough to start forming memories and you know, growing up, um, she was too far gone. But when I was eight years old, um, my mom has a brother who's basically the only survivor in his family. His parents both passed away, one because of HG, one in a car crash. The other two sisters of my mom also passed away because of HG. My mother passed away because of HG. My uncle, um, I think also because I, he's been through a lot of shit, you can imagine, so he has this trauma. He sat us down, all four of us as kids, me and my siblings, when I was eight years old. I'm the youngest. And he basically said, all right, you guys have this really shitty disease in your family, and um, you're either going to get it. If you get it, you're going to die of it. There's a 50-50% chance of you getting it. So his explanation was not the best, I'd say. It was pretty traumatizing for an eight-year-old kid to hear. Um, so me and a sister who's a year older than me, um, she was nine years old, I was eight. We absolutely just started bawling our eyes out. We're like, this is the end of the world. We're too young to know about this. We knew our mom was sick, but we didn't know it was going to, you know, be this much of an impact on our lives. Um, so we started crying. I think my brother at that time already knew about this. Um, my sister was pretty much the other sister, the third sister that we have. She was pretty much already um, on terms with it as well. So it was mostly just about me processing it and coming to terms with it. And then I think the past, um, after that she passed away and it just about still learning more about the disease, the disease every single day. But yeah, that was my first exposure to it, wasn't the best. And I only hope that no one else has to sit down through that when they're eight years old again. Absolutely. I'm sure in many ways this has changed all of your daily lives. How has it impacted? Can you share a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, what I'm gonna say, but uh, we're trying to take goals and make them smaller, easier to get to. Um, for me, I, I've always set goals in my life, and it was hard for me to cut down this go those goals to smaller goals. In the, on the way. And I know some of my things I really, really wanted to do or have in my life, I have, it's been a pr pr procedure for me to understand that I maybe never will. And uh, it took a lot of my mental cap cap capacity to uh, just try to live with it. So, but just, yeah, like Josephine said, the communication, always be open. Because if 
she, I suffer, she will suffer too. And the biggest thing is she need to know that even if I suffer, it, was, it won't, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, isn't that, is it, it isn't that a big of burden that I will leave her or anything. So it's very, very important to be open. Always talk, always communicate your feelings, what you are caring for that day. Because if she see, I, sees if I suffer, I don't, I don't communicate, she will suffer even more. And she will take she, her illness, the HD, and make that even bigger. So it's one of my biggest things is communicate to show so I don't need to suffer and she doesn't need to suffer. I think if I think about the impact on daily life, I could obviously look at that in a very singular way in terms of how it imp daily life impacts on Elaine every day. Um, but I think if I if I go back in time, you know, there was if I go back 20 years, for example, at the time, um, it, HD didn't impact us at all. It had no impact whatsoever. And I can remember sitting, looking ahead um, about 20 years ago, just feeling, I suppose, absolute terror, really, um, at, at what was coming. Um, and now, pretty much, we're in the eye of the storm. So, um, so now we try to work through pretty much daily life in terms of breaking it down into um, every single day and taking every single day at a time and trying not to look too far ahead because obviously not, not looking too far ahead without inserting the, the, all of the research and the other things that are coming along would be a mistake. And I think alluding to, to what the guy said earlier, which I thought was very, very helpful. But I think we were a very close family, and we we use each other and we we support each other constantly, and we talk everything out. So um, it impacts, but it it impacts on daily life in terms of obviously, you know, Elaine's routine, for example, bless her, is that she gets up later than than perhaps she used to. Um, she 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 she's careful where she walks in terms of the dogs that we have, etc. Um, and she, she takes time in terms of some of the, I suppose, dietary choices as well. So that's changed. And, you know, but hopefully with the research that's coming, that can be, that can be stopped in its tracks. And I do believe that. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so impact of HD on my life, um, I would say in every single aspect, right? Because I mean, my mom got HD at like 29, edging on 30, right? So um, for me, I never pictured my life above 30. So I always expected that if I do get HD, it would be at 30 and I give, give or take maybe good five years after that. And then I would figure myself basically gone, right? Um, so I think growing up, my dad also told us that just, I mean, I had a very different relationship with my dad as opposed to my brother. But um, my relationship with my dad, he basically just said, live your life as you would live it, completely normal person. Live it to your fullest, and when you turn 30, you can figure your life until then. So in my entire world, it's just been like, never planned above 30. Um, I have a corporate job, it pays the bills, I use the bills, uh, pay them, use the rest of the money, travel, do whatever I want, have fun. I live in Berlin, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> So I just like to, you know, completely be free and um, not make long-term decisions, at least. I don't like to plan too far in the future. I don't plan, I don't have a 10-year plan. I hardly even have a five-year plan, but that's a diff totally different topic that my boss will scream at me about. But I don't have a 10-year plan. I never had a 15-year plan. I just decided to just live every day, whatever comes, whatever happens, just enjoy it to the fullest. Um, just, you know, work through the trauma, work through the feelings that you have, go to therapy, which has helped me quite a lot as well. 
Um, also impacted my life. I decided at a very young age that um, I didn't want kids. I never wanted kids to begin with because um, as even if I am gene negative or for example, if I do end up getting the disease, I think even if we do have amazing options now, like um, just removing the gene from the child, make sure that your kid is HG free. I think in my head, it's mostly just also about having a kid, but then if I do end up being gene positive, having the kid go through the trauma that I went through and also having a kid growing up without a mother because I mean, every day in my life, I still feel that impact, you know, not having a mother growing up, not having that support system, not having a functional family or a support system growing up. And I don't want to inflict that on any kid. I don't think, um, my mother never had that opportunity. She never got to choose because she had no idea what the hell was happening to her or what she could have expected to happen to her as well. So at a very young age, I just decided kids are cute, but they're not for me. <laughs> I'll take care of all the other kids that my lovely friends will hopefully have soon. And I'll try to enjoy my time with them. But um, that was one of the biggest decisions that I made. But also impacting in my life, of course, will come to the relationships part as well. I always decided that I never wanted to be in a committed relationship um, because I didn't want to put that burden on someone else. And then years of therapy helped me realize that it's uh, the choice of the person who gets into the relationship with you. And now I'm at a point where I'm two years deep into a very nice relationship. So I understand that as you grow older, your opinions and your um, ideas on things might also change. I'm still very hell-bent on not having kids. Don't, don't get that idea wrong. But yeah, of course, as you grow older, things change as well. And I'm still learning, and I'm still growing with it. Absolutely. Thank you all for that. And that's a perfect segue. Yeah. That's a perfect segue into relationships. So this, I know this is a tough one. How has, and I'm going to go back to Minahill on this because you just touched in on this, how has HD affected your relationships and, and you've introduced it. So can you share a little bit more? Of course. So yeah, like I said, I'm 23. So most of my teenage years, I'd say I spent in very casual relationships. My brother's heard of so many boys at this point. He's probably exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had crazy abandonment issues, which is natural. I think anyone being in this situation might have experienced abandonment issues at some point. I was always scared to get into serious relationships because I was scared that if they find out about HD, they're going to think I'm a freak. They're going to leave me. They're going to see um, the history that I went through. They're going to see them. My mom's sick. She, they're not going to want to be part of any of this. Um, so for me, it was always just like, keeping the relationship up until the point that it gets serious. And as soon as the guy asked me, or girl, as soon as they asked me, OK, let's get serious, I would just be like, eh, hell no, sorry, that's not for me. I'm just going to keep this casual. If you can't deal with it, then I'm sorry, go find someone else. Because I'm not in the state of my life where I want to commit to anyone, because I don't want to put that burden on anyone. I mean, growing up, I saw how difficult it was on my dad. I saw the choices that he made. He was in a tough spot, very, very terrible choices. But at the same time, I can't really blame him because he had no idea how to deal with it. Um, so I avoided any sort of long-term relationships. I always built my friendships because I always saw friendships weren't that 100% sort of commitment. And I always knew that at some point, as much as my friends love me, they can opt out. They can take their own time. They have their own families. They can divert their focuses as well. With a partner, I always felt like it would be absorbing them into my trauma, absorbing them into also a toxic family. I didn't want to inflict that on anyone. Um, also seeing certain situations in my family where I just also kind of lost faith in love as well, growing up with parents who were basically hardly in love with my dad's situation. Um, so I guess I also lost faith in that little spark that you can have. So most of my life was just basically having fun. And then I think um, two years ago, I met this person who <laughs> then I came to this point where I'm like, OK, people are really nice. People care. They want to be there for you. They want to be there in the capacity that they allow themselves to be there for you. And then I opened up to him, found it easier to open up to my friends that I've known basically my whole life. They always knew I had a sick mom who passed away, but they never knew why. And they never knew the challenges that I was dealing with. So the same year, I opened up to my two best friends at home, and I told them, all right, this is the situation. And again, dark humor, which has helped me a lot. They joked about it as well. They were like, all right, well, you're OK right now, right? I was like, yeah. They're like, all right, let's go outside. Let's go get McDonald's. I was like, let's do it. So it was a very casual conversation with everyone. Um, I, don't, I didn't feel like I was burdening anyone at that point as well. 
So I think the older I'm getting and um, the more I realize it, it's totally okay to be vulnerable. And if your vulnerability is affecting someone else, it's totally okay for them to take a step back and take time for themselves to process it if they think it's too much for them in their mental health. Because everyone's mental health is totally in a different place right now, mostly in shambles because of the situation of the world right now. But it's totally okay if they also don't want to be a part of your life. No one is there to be 100% part of your life forever. Um, you're only here for a temporary time, amount of time in your life, so make the most of your relationships while you have them. At least that's what I've learned so far. <laughs> So the biggest thing living with Josephine, with the HD, for me, is my fear to not be, be able to be there for her. I'm very afraid that I will mess something up or make her sad or just don't. I'm afraid to not be the man, the partner she needs. Um, and uh, sometimes we are uh, visiting her parents. It's very hard for me to see her father. Um, it sticks with, could stick with me for weeks after. So that's one thing that's very hard for me. Um, But it's, it's giving me much too, because I've always been a person that always wanted to learn more and standing besides people, beside people I love and give me affection and things back. So it's, it's a lot of, it's, a, it's a, like I said before, it's a journey for me. It's just, it's just the tip of the iceberg right now, and uh, it's hard sometimes. I woke, uh, wake up early in the morning, and uh, I, I, I can't, I can't fall asleep again, because I can't comprehend the feelings about it. I, I, I what could I do more? So that's why I'm here. Um, it affects so much in life when you don't uh, know she's sick and got a grasp of what the future but it's very hard when someone you love got something you don't you don't know when you're gonna see something or what's so it's like you said, it's humor, a lot of humor. We're talking about uh, when uh, I'm gonna get like moving, you, you have to play music and we can dance. <laughs> <laughs> like, so the, oh, it became quite, quite hard to talk about. <laughs> but it's, it's so hard to understand what I can do and it's hard when I'm sitting at work it's sometimes it's just I can't work I have to take like 10 minutes just to breathe just to understand because it's something that remi reminds me about my situation and jo Josephine's situation and it's it's very very hard uh, um, in my upbringing my parents always taught me you you never surrender you never give up I think it's the Marines mm -hmm. that have that. Um, so it, it's always persevering. Never give up, even if you're at the lowest. And, and, like, at again, and, and again, communication. Um, it's... Uh, I don't know how I'm going to say it, but... It's, it's, it's tough sometimes. It's very tough. 
to see someone you love. And just sometimes, Josephine says, so why do I even keep on living? And the easy, easy answer is me. <laughs> <laughs> My two kids, which is, she is very wonderful with. But sometimes even I wonder why I keep living with her. Um, it's very, very important to take a breather. It's um, when I lost my mother, we was very close together. She always helped me. I was, a, what can you say, rascal. <laughs> <laughs> and she was the only one that believed in me all the time. And when she passed, Josef Josephine, who you just met, she just stepped in and told me, you are someone, you, your value in life for your kids, for yourself, for other people. And I'm trying to be the same, do the same to her. It, uh, some days it's harder than other. It takes a lot of uh, mental power and so on. Um, but I'm very, very glad for Josephine, even with the uh, HD, and um, yeah. So I think really it's all about perspective, if I'm honest, because I'm, I'm one of four brothers, and um, I'm not the youngest. There was one younger than me. His name was Tim, um, and this is relevant. Uh, <laughs> stay with me. Um, so Tim was born extremely, um, extremely poorly. He had spina bifida, he had kyphosis of the spine and multiple other problems. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk. Um, and he would have been about 50 now. But basically he was given eight hours to live. Um, and my mum said, you know, it's okay, I'll take, I'll take him home. She took him home and he died when he was 30. Um, during that time, basically the family, we carried him around, we, we picked him up, we loved him. And, um, and it, it became an integral part of how we viewed the world and how we, we went forward. And I think that's kind of shaped how I kind of operate within the family. Um, I think if you think about relationships in terms of HD, it's actually a real blessing. And that might sound a very strange thing to say, but it isn't. Because it's, it's a real friend filter. And I think the people who would be pretty much superficial and rubbish in your life will leave and that's what we found and the people who stay are superheroes um, and you know we've had some people who we thought were really close friends have gone and um, and the people who've stayed are immensely helpful incredible people and actually increasingly now a part of this community as well and I think that you know incredibly grateful to what you do um, but I think going forward as well, we've got another attitude as well, which is basically about, you know, now and living life now. And we, we spend money in a different way than we did prior to having <laughs> it. Funny that uh, so relationships with money is different. Um, we have more holidays. Uh, but, um, but no, I think, I think, it, I think is in a bizarre way, it is a blessing. And I think you've got to look at things in a completely, in a, on a bigger plan because I believe in everything being providential anyway. So what's happened to you is meant, meant to happen to you. And you know, I, I, know, I know that there's different ways of d philosophical differences that might say, well, I disagree with that. But that is my view. And I think if you embrace that fully, then you can go forward really positively because everything that you, is gonna happen to you is, is meant to happen for you. Uh, we've, we've got some fantastic friends in our life and, um, and everybody is, Everybody is super special in that. Okay, so we, um, we're a little over, which again is totally fine, but I just want to allow some time for a break between. So uh, in, a couple of, in a couple of statements, how do you all stay positive as you face how HD has impacted you individually? 
Um, like my brother said before, I can't echo it enough, therapy. <laughs> therapy is a really good uh, way of also acknowledging the way that you project your feelings onto other people. That's something I realized as well, like my abandonment issues, also just my um, anxiety and my anxious attachment styles, all of those things I would not have learned by myself if I didn't have um, someone that I could speak to on a daily basis. I think also growing up, I was very alone. Um, I had my siblings, but then when I was about like 17, I think we all moved out of the house. I have one sibling at home. I'm in Germany. My brother's in Canada. My other sister's in DC. So we're basically completely in different continents with absolutely different lives. We try to stay as in touch as possible, but of course, like we all have different lives, right? So I think that's also handling with HD a bit alone by yourself. Um, our dad basically never talks about HD. He avoids talking about it as much as possible. It's because of his own trauma as well and his denial of the disease as well. Um, so for me, it's always just been about therapy. That's the best thing that I can um, do for myself. Um, the, the other thing, I'll just keep it very short, dark humor, it helps a lot. <laughs> That's how I stay positive about it as well. I just joke about it whenever I can. I joke about my trauma whenever I can. Um, I met some people at this amazing Congress as well who've been in similar situations as me, some awesome people that I've joked with as well quite a lot about our trauma, about our situations. Um, I think just being here also just made me normalize the disease as well. It's something I was just so afraid to talk about with anyone um, before in the past couple of years. And I'm so casually talking about it, joking with people about, you know, neurodegenerative diseases and how they're taking over our lives. And um, then also just joking about dying of climate change. It's nice to be able to make a joke about of all of these things. It's what helps me cope. But of course, there are dark days. There are days almost every single day where I'm just like doubting myself. You know, when you see a little trigger movement of yourself and you're like, shit, okay, maybe it's happening now. It's happening earlier than it should. Maybe it's, you know, our genes are totally messed up and stuff. And on those days, um, something that's really helped me is fitness as well. I really like working out. I feel like it really gives me a lot of sense of control of my movements and also just sense of control of me feeling like I'm in the right headspace, able to think clearly. Um, and then of course, having an awesome support system, working, I work in a biotech and the biotech is also exclusively working on um, HG with a 15 year collaboration with CSGI as well. So I think being able to talk to my colleagues about it has been awesome for me because they've been able to normalize it for me, talk to me about it, um, just research that's going on, they talk to me about the disease, and every time I've told my colleagues, they were like, ah, oh, you got that shit disease, right, in your family? I'm like, yeah, I got that shit disease in my family. So yeah, just, um, just different coping mechanisms. I think it's so different for everyone. So, um, once again, communication. Let her know how you feel. Um, do things together. Sometimes just watching a movie in silence, just being there. Um, talk to others. Sometimes it could be Josephine's mother, maybe. Just talk when ventilation. Don't bottle it up, up because it's it's gonna explode some way. So. Like this, very new for me, being at Congress. Uh, I'm not that talkative, <laughs> so I'm not meeting a lot of new people, but it's so much, so much information to take in. And that's, for me, a very positive thing, because information, information. Um, have a faith. We as a family have a faith, so we believe in prayer, and we'll keep on doing that. Um, I also believe as well that the um, the intervention can come from the scientific community, and I think it, it's we're in, have, if you're going to have HD, probably now is the time to have it because I think the interventions are, are coming and it, incredibly exciting. And I think this weekend's been, you know, a real boon in that respect. And I think just taking every day at a time and enjoying enjoying every moment and that's pretty much it.
So I quickly add to that, also just thanking all the very dedicated scientists who have these amazing ideas and all the work that they're doing as well. Um, I'm just echoing on also just what you said. Now is the, I guess, not the best time. There's never a best time to have AC, but now would be a great time to also just um, be helping out in research as well. Um, we're at that point where technology is advancing like crazy, and um, I guess that gives us a sense of hope as well. So hats off to the awesome scientists that are working in the field. One more round of applause for our phenomenal panelists. We we definitely know this is not easy, but the fact that this is your first time sharing your experiences in a platform like this, you did amazingly well, and we really appreciate you taking a chance and doing this for us.